Hey everybody, welcome back to the Max Shank Show featuring my favorite recurring guest, Anders. Last time we talked about the truth about fitness and we got really good feedback from that. Probably best feedback of any show I have done so far. That's excellent. And what they liked and the comment I kept getting was, this is just two guys who know a lot about training, calmly talking about how exercise works and I thought it was really nice. Mm -hmm. so, uh, thank you guys for tuning in. We're going to talk about adaptability today. That was the next on our list. So uh, Anders, I'll kick it off to you. What do you what do you think about adaptability and how would you try to define it? Mm. So <clears throat> adaptability or adaptations are mostly changes to stressors. Uh, so that, in my opinion, could be your environment or just like the, the, yeah, the other stressors you come across, which I guess all comes down to the environment uh, in the end. And from there, you'll make some sort of change or adaptation uh, that can both be negative, positive, or just neutral. So change from a stimulus. Change from a stimulus, yeah. yeah. And it can be, like you said, that stimulus can be the people you hang out with, mm -hmm. that can be your physical environment, that can be the forces on your muscles and joints, mm -hmm. that can certainly be the foods you eat. The foods you eat. And I think probably the most important thing I wanna say about adaptation is that if you look at the wide variety of different things that humans are able to do and take it to the crazy extremes, it should, it should be a signal to you that you can adapt a lot. Mm -hmm. So the whole, the whole fallacy that we're very like fixed creatures is probably like one of the worst sins with regard to health and fitness. Because the truth is, we're adapting all the time. We were talking about before the cameras switched on that the different parts of your body uh, recycle mm -hmm. all the time at different rates. So apoptosis, which is a fancy word for your cells replicate and die, uh -huh. uh, happens in your uh, guts every few days, happens uh, to your taste buds every week or so, happens to different bone cells, either two weeks, a few months, or up to 20 years <laughs> for the osteocytes. So your body is just constantly responding to adaptation. And I think human beings have to be one of the most nurture dependent creatures because we are totally helpless for way longer than any other animal. Mm -hmm. Like a, a harpy eagle is helpless for like two years. And I think sperm whales are also helpless and they have to stay with their mother for several years. But I mean, even if you were a really good parent, would you feel confident after five years of parenting to just send your kid off to go be like fending for itself? Yeah. No. We're, no one would. Lizards and octopus, they come out of the egg they're ready to rock. Mm -hmm. They can figure it out on their own with, with no nurturing whatsoever. So to me, that means that we have to be the most adaptable. We can absorb language, which is a absolute crazy miracle that none of us could fully understand. And, you know, we can be a sumo wrestler or a gymnast. <laughs> we can do like this huge variety of different things and it's all <laughs> there are, you know and you also can have on the the negative side you can have like a child soldier yeah from giving them a really harsh stimulus but that's my point is we're way more adaptable than unfortunately most health professionals would consider mm -hmm. because in our culture right now we're so desperate to have like a if this, then this, mm -hmm. if this, then this. And we want to apply that generally to everybody. Yeah. So 
if you eat a carb, you will get diabetes or something along those lines. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, something like that. But uh, we're very unique DNA, unique ancestry. There are certainly some fundamental truths about mm. adaptation. Like if you constantly eat too much food and don't move enough, you will become fat and you will have more problems with life itself, every disease. Yeah. You'll have a destructive uh, codependent relationship with food. Mm -hmm. You'll have all of these different problems, but they're all started from, you know, using food improperly, basically. Yeah. Which usually is an adaptation caused by some trauma of some kind mm -hmm. uh, or just a destructive pleasure circuit. Uh, and I think that's that's got to be the most common one. I think we're like three quarters obesity in this country or something like that. <laughs> that that's like crazy to think yeah. that, I mean, people kill themselves way more than anything kills them. Oh, 100%. Because all of the, like, the big diseases, that's just the way people die. But the cause of that is because they like don't take care of themselves in the first place. And the reason for that is going to be maybe something in their childhood, maybe a combination of all those things. But, you know, using food as a self-soothing mechanism or just like a, a quick pleasure hit and not really having that adultness of being able to defer gratification to later mm -hmm. and do what needs to be done, which is kind of how I feel like adult is to a certain extent. I feel like it's self-sufficiency plus deferred gratification. Child doesn't really do that. Child is just kind of bouncing around from thing to thing. Yeah. And they're like, I want this, so I'm going to have it now. And if I don't have it now, I'm going to scream and cry on the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everything's either the best thing ever or the worst tragedy of their whole lives. So yeah, that's that's my main that's my main thing about adaptation. I would say is we're way more adaptable than uh, many experts give us credit for, and uh, you know, it, it works both ways. You can adapt into a giant blob <laughs> <laughs> with a, a lack of good stress or you stress. Yeah. And an excess of negative stress, including just purely overeating. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to it's hard to say with certainty what stimulus would be worse for you, being obese or smoking cigarettes all the time. It certainly depends on how obese and how many cigarettes. But if if you had to choose between being you know, like my height, 5'9 or so, and 180, uh, and smoking cigarettes, or 5'9 and 320, you probably have a better quality of life smoking the cigarettes and not being that big. Yeah, pr probably. And maybe even live longer. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, it's different for everybody. It will be different for everybody. Right. And I mean, I used to smoke cigarettes and... Mm -hmm. I'd say that probably negatively impacted my quality of life to mm. a point that I could think was equal to obesity. I've never been obese. I've yeah. been chubby, but never, uh, never fat yeah. per se. Uh, <laughs> but just like having Those trouble. Are technical terms: <laughs> chubby, fat, and obese. <laughs> I was also chubby for the record. Yeah, um, but when I smoked cigarettes, I would have like. And warnings, coughing up loogies, um, having trouble breathing, not really being able to like run without having trouble breathing, that right. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm guessing that that's pretty similar to being obese uh, in many ways. Yeah, probably so. I mean, I've never smoked cigarettes, but I have... Uh, tried lots of other destructive habits mm -hmm. and you only what's funny to me is a lot of the stuff that's only like partway destructive 
we're talking about adaptation, so of course we're talking about all these different stimuli that are available to people now, is you usually don't even recognize what's happening until you stop doing it. Mm -hmm. I think that's true, especially for many of the people who come to the gym. Like they don't know what they're missing because they've never tried to move that way. Like 100%. They, they, have, they have hips and a spine and ankles that are just frozen basically mm -hmm. like in utter disrepair and it's funny how like a little stimulus they're like wow i didn't know how crippled i was yeah basically uh so i think that's a that's a big deal and in terms of if we can kind of move that on to the the training side of things mm -hmm. for stimulus i think that one of the there are so many fantastic ways that you can change yourself. Oh, yeah. You can exercise just to break up the pattern of what mm -hmm. you're doing. So you can do a brief something and your mental state will be totally different, which will have a domino effect all the way down because it's oh, usually of course. nervous system top down. You can... Uh, increase the strength of your bones and tendons and ligaments and muscles, of course. And unfortunately, I, th I still think the majority of exercise is done as energy management, like trying to use excess calories mm. as almost like a punishment or a penance for the food choices. And the big issue there, I think, is that the opportunity cost of what they could be doing mm -hmm. is they could be doing so much more of that, you know, mobilizing and strengthening and increasing your speed and increasing your eye-hand coordination. But it it's like going on a road trip and then someone's like, how was your road trip? And it's like, well, we, we used 40 gallons of fuel. It's like, well, where did you go? It doesn't matter where we went. It doesn't matter what we did. It just matters how much energy we burned off. Oh, 100%. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it becomes a trap. Like if you exercise to burn calories, it usually means that you'll do something really, really hard. Whether that would be like a, a HIIT type workout where you do short intervals um, and smoke yourself completely or 20 rep squat sets or whatever. In the long run, it might affect you in a way where you don't really want to move the rest of your day. So you just sit around. Um, and trust me, the moving around throughout the day will burn way more calories than the HIIT workout you did in the end. That is such a huge lesson that many people just still don't know. Yeah. I went really down the rabbit hole once looking into all this. And mm -hmm. I started, I, I went and got a bunch of those different charts that show you, you burned this many calories with an hour of this activity, mm -hmm. this many calories with an hour of it. And there's some discrepancy, but there's like yeah. ge generally. And what's interesting is in economics, there's a term called the marginal cost or diminishing marginal returns. They're kind of related. So for each extra bit of effort, you put out, how much do you get for it? And the classic example they usually use is, if you eat a donut, that gives you lots of benefit. The second donut gives you less benefit. The third, even less. And then eventually it actually Reverses. goes back around to being, it's very costly to eat that donut where mm -hmm. it was very fun and beneficial before. Yeah. And so what's funny to me about the calorie burn and it's kind of like what you said is it's not like you actually burn that many more calories doing something of a crazy intensity than like going for a walk with a weight vest on, mm. for example. It, it's exactly it, it's like 15, 20 percent. I mean, it depends. Obviously, there's cro there's a difference between cross country skiing, trail running and jogging and going for a walk and just regular weight training. Of course. But the point I think we're both making is that if you are using exercise as like a calorie burning tool, 
is probably the least effective way to use exercise and it's also the least effective way to restrict calories mm -hmm. because as we've talked about before one chocolate chip has enough energy to take you almost a hundred steps yeah it's 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 so important to control the stimuli of the foods that you eat but that's that's one of those things that requires nuance and self-reflection and you know uh, self-examination which is by far the hardest thing to do and mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's hmm. kind of trailed off there but it's it's so important to not um, I think the word is conflate those things together exercise and calorie burning mm. exercise if you're doing it at the highest level you don't even care how many how much energy you're burning unless you are an elite athlete who's trying to make sure they don't burn too much energy yeah versus the food that they're getting it should never be a way to uh, restrict calories mm. because you're you're just sacrificing too many excellent things that don't look like they that don't burn a lot of calories like balancing and you know jumping but resting plenty in between jumps you know it doesn't feel oh this isn't hard enough we only jumped five times and then we rested for 90 seconds like well you know we did some single leg balancing in between we maybe did some mm. core exercises but it's not uh, it's not something that you really want to rush and I think that's probably one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my own training and coaching students you want to know very clearly when you're in one of those modes where it's time to work and you just work like when you're doing sprints go ahead and sprint fast don't like blow out your <laughs> knees or something like that or your Achilles doing hill sprints with no warm-up but you know ramp up and then that's where you want to put some of that effort out or mm -hmm. you know one of my favorite things to do is like pull the sled for 15 or 20 oh, minutes yeah. and just be like the workhorse on the plow for a while and when I'm doing that I'm not doing anything else but I'm also not doing it for calorie management either but the stimulus that you can get from those things is extremely powerful mm -hmm. uh, and specific very specific which leads us to one of the most important rules which is the said principle mm -hmm. specific adaptation to impose demand, demand. So whatever you do, your body adapts, and the way I heard it was always and exactly. Okay. So it's always doing this adaptation. So when you're sitting down, you won't be thinking, oh, said principle. But said principle is in effect. If you sit down for eight hours a day, your body is going to hear that message over and over again, always, constant. Hmm. So... It's going to say, how can we be exactly better at sitting, better at sitting down? <laughs> yeah. And your body is so good at being energy efficient, mm -hmm. which takes us right back into why you shouldn't use exercise as food punishment. It's going to find the safest and most efficient way for you to sit down all the time. So it's going to shorten up your hip flexors. It's going to put your body uh, effortlessly into the posture that you most frequently are mm. and so the key for that specific adaptation specific it's always and exactly that's what I try to explain to people is always and exactly and the always part makes a really good case for high frequency training mm. and you know I've I'm a bit of a dabbler I like to do a whole lot of things and music is one of those and I have found that several five-minute sessions throughout the day or 10 minutes or however long I feel like goes a really long way because you have this on and then off. So you get a break in between, which is a different aspect of learning where your brain has a chance to kind of organize stuff. Uh, but you are also getting that 
stimulus with a greater frequency. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of that spectrum, you have dinosaur training. You remember that one? Mm -hmm. Look into that. Yeah. Where you just murder yourself in the gym roughly once a week and use gigantic weights and that's that's all the stimulus you need and the rest of the time is just resting and eating yeah. basically recovering from that Reco stimulus. recovering from that stimulus isn't it amazing that we can have gymnasts doing these like flips and rings and stuff like that and then the sumo wrestlers doing their thing and you just look at how many interesting things the human body can adapt to mm -hmm. from that from that blank at the beginning that that should let anybody listening realize that they can change a lot oh. no matter how old they are too because that said principle is always always working there and there are so many stories you hear about some lady takes up bodybuilding at 80 and by 90 she's this like monstrous bodybuilder oh yeah it's it's incredible how adaptable we really are mm. training wise uh food sensitivity wise yeah socially socially emotionally emotionally tell me about it <laughs> um yeah so what uh, what can you do to ensure that the adaptations are positive? Oh, man. It's the same solution for everything else. It's personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, you can get a little further along by getting a, a mentor to hold you accountable to doing the things that are good for you. My friend... Martin Rooney said that a coach is someone who gets you to do what you know you should. Yeah. <laughs> so um. that's that's something. I think the environment matters a lot. Uh -huh. um, when I was talking to someone at the gym yesterday who they just signed up today, uh, that's what I mentioned is just the people that you're around makes a, a big difference. So if you're around a bunch of people who are prioritizing their health mm -hmm. and exercising regularly and checking in on you and, you know, we have members who say, hey, I didn't see you in class. How's it going? Yeah. That, that can be the difference between coming back to the gym the next day and living the rest of your life on the couch. Uh -huh. It can be very lonely and sad to be an adult sometimes. Oh, 100%. So having that feel like the term like-minded community is so overused but that's that's really what it is it's mm. people who are uh, gonna support and challenge you and I think that's also the most important thing in a in a romantic relationship too is you want someone who will uh, help you feel safe and supported but you also want someone who will challenge you mm -hmm. to be a, a greater version of yourself there's got to be some sort of fire there yeah. I guess that kind of ties into the emotional adaptation a little bit. We could try to get more specific because you were mm. mentioning that earlier. The emotional adaptation to stimulus. I mean, I guess it kind of comes down to coping mechanisms, I suppose. Maybe that's a different thing. Yeah. I mean... Because it can be like, positive or negative. Yeah, but, I mean, most things in, or everything in our envir environment provides some sort of stimulus, right? Mm. Um, so we can take TV or music um, as an example. Um, if you only watch very depressing movies uh, or TV shows... Mm and you only listen to music about people who want to murder other people or <laughs> any other very negative <laughs> message, your emotional and mental state is probably not going to be the greatest. Probably. Probably. Uh, there's always some people that can push Thrive through it and uh, yeah. thrives on it. Uh, I'm not one of those people. Um, right. But it's kind of like the 
the uncle that everyone had who smoked cigarettes and drank their entire life and mm. lived till they were 110 mm. or whatever it is. It's that survivorship yeah. bias. Yeah, there's um, always one yeah. person like that. that <laughs> um, so you can do a lot to alter your emotional state simply by the, the inputs you get from your environment. And that's what you're talking about with the gym as well, right? Yeah. Coming into a space with people that are like-minded and happy to see you and moving with you and that will change your emotional state quite a bit as well. Well, I think smiling is one of the best inputs and outputs. Oh, 100%. Smiling face. You know, my neighborhood, everyone's really nice to each other. Most people have dogs. Mm -hmm. Everyone, like, waves and smiles and says hello. So by the time I've gone around the block, which is like a 33-minute walk or so, I've timed it a few times, of course, <laughs> uh, you, feel, you feel a little better. Mm -hmm. that, that has an effect. If you don't see any smiling faces, that's going to have an effect on your emo emotional state. And it's going to maybe determine what you do when you feel those emotions. Because I think that's the other important part of this puzzle is not just like what stimuli make you feel better but when you feel a certain emotion what do you then do as a self-soothing mechanism mm -hmm. my, my favorite self-soothing mechanism is food my second favorite is avoidance <laughs> and everybody responds to things differently when they're emotionally like Maybe we'll just call it emotional fight or flight. Mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, it's usually just the ego feels threatened in some way. And some people cry and some people yell and some people do really hard workouts and some people go to the, the booze bottle or mm. uh, you know opiate of some kind or scrolling on social media. And it can be really difficult to break up those patterns. And it's sometimes even more difficult to just be aware of those patterns. And that's why that community aspect, having a, a partner or a mentor or a community that you're a part of that helps you notice those things mm -hmm. that are probably just running on autopilot. I like the quiet spots. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's not enough of those. Oh. Yeah. Doesn't have to be noise all the time. Doesn't that feel nice? A mm. quiet time? Mm hmm. Noise is a, an input, a huge one. That's a stimulus. And, uh, sensory. Yeah, a stimulus that most people have throughout every waking hour. Um, Give me something. Give oh, me something. Some sort of stimulus. Give me some. Ah. And, and it's, to me, that is like undeveloped child behavior. Mm hmm. Because for whatever reason, you know, parents teachers, peers, media, it kind of doesn't matter because eventually you take responsibility or you don't. But if you can't get comfortable doing nothing, you will be exclusively at the mercy of whatever those self-soothing behaviors are. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting right now because, you know, being a, like a crack addict or a meth addict I'm assuming they're really fun because people sacrifice their whole lives to do them. I've never done crack or meth mm. uh, so far. Could change. I don't have any <laughs> plans right now, but changed my mind about a lot of things. Mm. And with something like social media and eating, eating it's a little more easy to see because the evidence will be around the belly. But if someone just is, you know, scrolling on the internet and entertaining themselves that way all the time, there's no like visible signal that that's happening. You know, their teeth don't fall out. They don't gain tons of weight. So it's kind of this 
secret addiction almost. Mm. And I think food, social media, mm -hmm. and pornography were the hardest things for me to get in line. Yeah. Honestly. And if you think about how creatures work, mm -hmm. it's like food, socializing, and sex on, yeah. on demand all the time. My refrigerator is full of food all the time. I know how to make delicious food, which of course makes it even worse. I can just make something delicious any old time. And if you're hooked up to the internet, for the most curious creatures, mm -hmm. that's us, all us humans, the, the deal right there that you can see anything, anytime that you want, that can be a tough thing to say no to. Yeah. Especially because you get that dopamine, which is not just the reward, it's the expectation of something novel. Mm -hmm. The expect, ooh, I'm gonna get something, but I don't know what it is. It's like when gambling is another thing that people use as uh, entertainment, let's call it, self-soothing behavior. It's all just to avoid facing the reality of life, which is, this is a weird thing we're all doing right now. It's taken a lot of cooperation to get us this far. <laughs> Trying to find meaning in your life can be really difficult. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I think peace and generosity and making choices from a place of love is, that works best for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, gambling is another thing that people often ruin themselves financially sometimes mm. they lose a marriage with someone they love but it's about when the dice are in the air it's not it's not whether you win or lose it's that feeling of like oh gambling so we took gambling which is that like unknown rush of i might win something but i don't know ooh surprise and uh socializing which is the most important to us because look Look how social we are. Mm. And very ego-driven creatures, too. So it's all about who our friends are. It's like that saying, it's not, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of truth to that. With regard to adaptation, too. Yeah. Man, this is a crazy topic, isn't it? It is. Um, there's something really comfor comforting about knowing that you can change at any time and that anyone, literally anyone, can impose some sort of stimulus to themselves and experience some sort of change. So if you just buckle down and pay attention to what's happening, you can pretty much adapt out of any sticky situation. If you don't like where you're at right now, try something, take note of the change. If it didn't seem positive, try something else. If it does seem positive, keep doing that thing. Mm. I think my favorite example of that is breathing. Mm -hmm. Because if you expand on your ability to take one conscious deep breath or a shallow breath through your nose, preferably just an easy breath. You expand that out, that power is always there. Mm. And so you can use that to take a breath. You can use that to go for a short walk. You can use that to call up a friend you haven't talked to in a while. And all of those things will have benefits that are not measurable. You know, we're, we're like, how many calories will I burn with this workout? How many dollars will I make if I do this thing? And it's like, eh, don't worry about that so much. Just recognize that power to change mm -hmm. is the same as taking one breath. It's just a little more. It just looks a little bit different. Take one breath, do one push up, do one squat. Mm. It's, it's that same ability to just harness and focus your attention to here and now 
Mm -hmm. which is really difficult because part of the reason that humans have gotten to this point is because we're paranoid. So we stockpile lots of food and we farm because being here and now and hunting and gathering is not really for us. So we think more into the future and now we have, you know, college and mortgages and 401ks and retirement. and We have all of these things that are so, so far in the future. So mm -hmm. it makes us just rush all the time in the present without ever really gaining traction of what's going on. And I think that's probably what destroys a lot of people. And then you have another common barrier to that change because as you said, it's the, it's the most amazing power in the world. Like no, no lizard is like, you know, I think I'm, I'm going to go live in a different place now, or I'm going to act like a dog. You know? mm -hmm. I'm trying to give like another animal example. I don't think that one flew, but, <laughs> but it's the most powerful thing to be able to just change on a dime. And you don't know what that benefit will be. Uh, I stopped drinking coffee like two months ago now. I don't even miss it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really odd. I'm surprised I don't because that was a big part of my enjoyable morning. But mm -hmm. it turns out it was like not that big a deal. And I've been drinking coffee almost every day for like five years. So it can happen all at once, which is incredible power. But I think that also is a threat to the ego because the ego likes to maintain itself. It likes to feel secure in the story. And that's also why people don't put themselves out there very much. That's also why people fear uh, rejection mm -hmm. because they're afraid their ego will be damaged. Like, oh, if, if I am then like the story of you is what the ego tries to protect. So if you try to change the story of you, your ego is basically going to perceive that as well, he's trying to kill me and replace me with another guy. So mm -hmm. it would be really difficult. It's like the, the, some people prefer the familiar pain to the unknown, even mm. if the unknown could be better. Some, I would say a lot. Yeah, I would say so too. So that's, there's a quote about we're, we're not afraid that we're weak. We're afraid that we're powerful beyond measure or something like that. I don't think afraid is the word, but you get the idea. <laughs> it, it doesn't scare us uh, that we're uh, powerless. What scares us is that we're powerful beyond measure. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know how to channel that energy. And it goes back to what I how I describe attention to people, which can be like a laser or a lantern. Mm -hmm. And it's not that one is better, it's just that one is appropriate at different times. Like just quietly sitting where you are, you can be a laser and focus on your breath or something like that, or you can focus on a single point on the wall. But it's also really nice to do that martial arts soft eyes where you just kind of let your peripheral vision expand and you're not really looking at anything specifically but you just sort of soften that awareness mm -hmm. and it's good to be able to cycle between those two so you know if you're on or off basically uh-huh yeah and and switch quickly um at least in the world we live in, where we talk athleticism all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that as one of the ways to describe the best athletes from the average athletes, is the ones who can cycle more quickly from fully relaxed to fully tense. Exactly. The best athletes. Yeah. And I think that's that seems yeah. true to me. And if you put that on that attention as well, mm. being able to go from that martial arts soft awareness to I got a hold of that arm 
Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty darn cool. And what's interesting is all of the health benefits and all of the health destroyers all come from that ability to focus mm -hmm. and that ability to experience that ego death. You have to tolerate that ego death of your prior story of yourself because as you mentioned, a lot of people hang on to that familiar story, even if it's killing them, because they're afraid of the unknown of a new one. Yeah. And that's basically the ego's only job is permanence. That's why it's natural to want to leave some sort of a, a mark or a legacy. That's why the most popular cave painting is a stenciled left hand. Because mm -hmm. even if you don't have something to say, you just want to say, I was here. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. Yeah. And I don't, think, I don't think other animals do that. I think other animals just have babies and then die. Mm. But yeah. some of them do pass on some really good nurturing, hmm. like orca and gorillas. Orcas teach hunting. Gorillas teach which plants are poisonous or not. Yeah. And maybe a few other things. I don't, <laughs> I'm not fluent in either. No, not yet. But not yet. You can change that at any moment. I can change it at any moment. I'm going to go live in the jungle with gorillas for a while, like Jane Goodall. <laughs> 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 that would be a pretty hard 180 from what I've been doing. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. They were able to cheat, teach sign language to so many of those creatures, huh? Mm. I don't hear a lot of people talk about that anymore. Yeah. There's too much news. Too, too much, much new, news. New yeah. stuff to stimulate yeah. you. Yeah. Communication is an interesting one. Fear porn, I think we call it, right? Mm hmm. Doom scrolling. Have Doom you heard scroll that term? I've heard that term. Doom yes. scrolling. It's, that uh, does not sound fun. <laughs> no. No. I don't really uh, <laughs> pay attention to the news. Limbic hijack. Have you heard that one? No. Basically, you know, limbic systems, as I understand it, sympathetic, parasympathetic, mm -hmm. basically. So they, in order to capture your attention better, they scare you more. So they hi get you all amped up into like, hate this person and fear this thing and if all things being equal if you see a news story that says the weather's going to be nice you'll probably just stop right there but if you see a meteor going to hit Encinitas tonight you would probably you would probably read that probably read but to to be fair, uh, I would say the meteor is uh, yeah, that's true. I a would pretty that too. pretty important thing to know. That's true. It's not a good example. No. But but I see what you're getting at. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of, I would want to know actually. Yeah. We need to find a friend of ours who does watch the news and have them let us know if there is a meteor. Oh, I know the odds are low. But... Uh, I'm certain my wife would tell me. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Can you put me on that phone tree? <laughs> uh, communication yeah. is so important. You it know what is. I call human beings now? No, what? I mean, if I usually just call them by their name, but humans as a whole I refer to as walkie-talkies. Walkie-talkies. <laughs> that's nice. Because that's all we're good at. Yeah. Mm. Compared to the other animals, I've said this before, we got top speed, very slow, maximum strength, uh, pound for pound is pathetic compared to other animals. Oh. No, no armor, no poison. We have like one-ish babies at a time. Meanwhile, you got these crazy arachnids with poison and webs and 500 babies at a time <laughs> it's like how did we make it 
Well, talking. And more importantly, writing. Mm -hmm. Because that was this like huge exponentializer where knowledge just was able to propagate like DNA. Sometimes like an idea, like iDNA. Mm -hmm. And so the only reason that we're able, oh, it's so funny. We'll go back a step, but it all started with accounting. So the oldest records we have of written stuff is in cuneiform. And it's like keeping track. This guy gave this guy 15 onions for 12 shekels or something mm -hmm. like that. And, and so it's mostly just record keeping. And then you also have some stories mm. with lessons mixed in. And you have uh, like recipes, protocols, mm -hmm. which of course with your chef background, the, the way to make eggs is more simple than um, refining uranium for a nuclear reactor. But in my opinion, they're both recipes. Oh, 100%. And like Isaac Newton said, if I've seen further, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. What he meant was, I've gotten the ability to access, and now with the internet we have that, we can access any information from basically any time. Yep. It is important to consider the source, because there's a lot of stuff out there that's totally false, but there's enough stuff that's completely true that we can benefit from to make these stories, make these recipes. Mm -hmm. And look, even with our low stats on strength and speed and venom and armor and dexterity and all these kind of things, we've been able to win the game of, of, of what the food chain. Yeah. Like we don't, because of how good we are, it's all cooperating. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to just survive out in the wilderness on your own. I, I love watching guys do that, by the way. Yeah. I love when they're like, all right, we're going to drop this guy in the woods for a few months, and here's a knife and fire starter or something. Figure it out. And when that person does, I'm like, that is amazing. But it's all about cooperation. So it's all about communication. And just to go back to the original point, we're walkie-talkies. We can walk really long distance mm -hmm. because our skeletons are stacked vertically. So we're just dancing with gravity in the most efficient way possible. Uh huh. And as far as I understand, no other animal has the diversity of communication because they probably would have done some farming too. Yeah. Although ants do some farming. Do you they know do. know about that? They do. The leaf cutter ants, mm -hmm. they cut leaves, but they don't eat the leaves. They bring the leaves back to a fungus. The fungus eats the leaves and then grows, and then the ants eat the fungus. Mm -hmm. And then they also will milk aphids. Yeah. Um, they probably communicate in a different way than we do. Um, yeah, through scents and pheromones. So they're like sense pheromones, chemo, yeah. Chemo reception, I think. Um, and I think we communicate as people with other things than words, for sure. Or I know that body language, body scent. language, scent. Uh, yeah, That's energy. Why I think cologne is so fun. energy. Yeah. I mean, smiling, like sm we talked about earlier. Smiling. That's a very different. All vibration. those micro expressions. Uh -huh. um, yeah. We see it every day when we work with clients. Like, we pick up on their signals and they pick up on ours. And mm -hmm. uh, every time I sit after a session and kind of evaluate on how the session went, I know exactly like what kind of energy I put out and what kind of session I was able to give that person. Mm. Um, and that's not only what you, what kind of words you use way more than just words, even sitting quietly with another person. And, you know, we threw the Frisbee around in the park earlier, mm -hmm. and then we just sat under that tree for a while, 
and we were talking a bunch, but also there were those moments where it was just very quiet. Yeah. And it feels different person to person. And, oh, 100%. And your sensitivity is going to be, I would say, based on skill. But that skill is not necessarily something that you, maybe it is something you develop, but it's about that quietness, mm -hmm. about letting your other senses, uh, letting your other senses in. And I think that's maybe one of the toughest things for people now is the, the sight and sound are so heavily dominant. It's all about audio visual, but the, the feeling and the tasting and the smelling are probably somewhat diminished. And then just that sensing and compassion and smiling and just, mm. you know, feeling the energy of another person close to you. And I know you and I enjoy uh, martial arts like jujitsu and wrestling, and that's a, a different type of conversation that has its own lovely benefits mm. including you including bringing you just a taste of the reality of life and death oh 100 percent. i've always thought very that much fun. so and i do believe that animals probably communicate in that way as well oh definitely i mean dogs are a great example right yeah. they'll uh they'll pick up on your energy right away mm -hmm. uh and know exactly how to be around you. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the, the postures of different animals at different times, whether it's mating season or mm -hmm. a show of dominance. I've always thought hyenas were some of the more interesting creatures because they're very cooperative. They can mm. be in packs bigger than lions. Yeah. And what's interesting about hyenas, one of them, I thought, there are tons of interesting things. I think they have the strongest bite, pound for pound, of mammals or something like that. Mm. You can crush bones. Is when two factions or packs of hyenas are in a dispute of some kind, they don't actually fight. So they do this like maneuvering thing for up to two hours. So they will like run and come back and run and come back and bark and yelp. And what they're doing is they are getting a feel for which pack is dominant. So how smart is that? Rather than have a gigantic bloodbath where, you know, let's say it's 60 on 60. Now you have like 60 die. Mm. <laughs> they have this other way of communicating and determining who is the dominant and who is the submissive, and then the the losers jog on. Mm -hmm. and the winners claim that hunting territory. So there are all kinds of really interesting ways, including pheromones. You know, like the Atlas moth mm. has that. A, a lot of moths, I think, and different females will secrete a pheromone and males too. It's, it's yeah. really fascinating how many different other ways there are to communicate, but just tying it back to the topic of adaptation. <sighs> what do you say when you talk to yourself? What do you say when you talk to somebody else? How carefully do you choose your words? Mm -hmm. I think that one of the one of the greatest evils of social media is what I call drone strike discourse. People will say things that they would never say to you in person. Mm -hmm. They'll say horrible things because everybody's trying to get love. If they can't get love, they'll try to get power or respect, which is kind of similar. And if they can't get that, they will settle for provoking attention. Mm -hmm. Because the worst thing for a human being is to be isolated. That's why in a lot of ancient cultures it was preferable to be executed than to be exiled. Mm. Just to show you how important socializing is for us. And it's, it's a pacifier 
it doesn't satisfy you. You don't feel good. Nobody feels good mm -hmm. to say a mean thing to somebody else. But it's possible just the same way a drone strike is way easier than to like strangle a person. I've never like strangled a person. Not all the way. Strangled you like halfway. <laughs> DJ I've also strangled. Basically, I'm just trying to get guests who I've strangled before ah, I to see. assert my I dominance. Yeah. That's also why I have this much larger chair today, as opposed to last time we had the same chair. Oh, <laughs> blood <just>, thickens. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I just think about how personal that is, mm -hmm. to like strangle someone or even stab someone, versus a drone strike is like, you can sort of separate your humanity from it. And that humanity is what allowed us to cooperate so well in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, like, would you say that to that person if you were in the same room and if you cared about them? And if you are coming from that standpoint, you're gonna communicate with yourself much more compassionately. You're gonna communicate with other people much more compassionately. You're gonna choose your words carefully because you're gonna recognize that those words are like, uh, it's like a knife. It well, can perform surgery and save you, or it can stab you and kill you. Yeah, well, it's it's a stimulus. Exactly, that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 So words to messages is a stimulus, and you can get those messages directly. Mm-hmm. Or kind of secondhand, passively, through a device of some kind. And the messages you receive, that's really, that's a skill you can improve, I think, is to not be affected by the messages that you receive. Um, there's always gonna be some effect. Like if yeah. you're surrounded by negative talk all the time, mm -hmm. probably you gotta get out of there. But it's possible just like uh, the power of no, being able to build up the callus of tolerating the word no, tolerating a rejection of some kind, and then also drawing your boundaries using the word no. Mm -hmm. So if someone infringes on your boundary, having the resolve to not think, oh, this person will hate me or something if, if I don't say yes to them. So to be able to use the word no to draw that boundary or to be able to tolerate that no, which is like a momentary rejection, without letting it affect you personally, without letting it damage that ego. Mm. But there are all kinds of different stimulus. And I, I think, I guess you could break it down to like brain stimulus and body stimulus. I'm, I'm trying to simplify it down, but that's probably not quite good enough. Brain stimulus is kind of energetic. Body mm. stimulus is kind of physical. And of course, the mind and body are not separate. It's a feedback loop. Yeah, they're going to be the connected. Yeah. yeah. So I think a lot of people think themselves into various illnesses. You certainly are going to have a higher susceptibility of catching a cold, for example, if you're in a totally depressed state, because you're not going to be secreting hormones the same way all these neurotransmitters are not going to be functioning at optimum your mm -hmm. guts might be all twisted which will then have like a snowball effect to making worse food choices making worse entertainment choices not choosing your words very carefully and saying something mean to another person which uh, unless you have no memory whatsoever you'll probably carry that with you mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I've found in myself. And I'm, I'm pretty darn careful with what I say to other people now. But when I was in middle school, I, I wasn't really. No. And what's funny is that's now roughly 20, about, about 20 years ago. And I still remember some of the things that I said and did. And it, it wasn't like I, it was horrible, but I saw that I made the person feel bad, and I guarantee I've thought about that more than that other person. Oh, one, probably. Most likely, and uh, that's 
that phase is like learning how to use this powerful tool of language. Um, just, uh, you know, for now, the like highest level of communication. Yeah, until we have psychic abilities. Until we have psychic abilities. Which we've had a few experiences all, like that. Yeah, we have. And That's pretty weird. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if the psychic abilities are already there without getting too far out. Um, that it is a combination of this like energetic, uh, emotional feedback loop. And uh, at some point, we'll just be good enough to use it. I feel like part of the reason we shy away from that stuff is because it's less explicit and not everybody is in on it. Mm. It's like, I have this phrase, not yet measurable. Mm -hmm. There's so much out there that's not yet measurable. Like, we just don't know. We know what we know. And my joke is that the size of the universe is always the same as mm. the size of our telescopes. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever, However powerful our telescopes are, hey, that's how big the universe is. And however good our microscopes are, that's how small the really smallest stuff is. And of course that's not the case because that has changed time and time again. First the earth was flat, then it was the center, then the sun was the center, and then some guy said the sun's not the center, it's actually just one of those stars, and of course he was um, kindly burnt at the stake for for saying that. How dare he? <laughs> how dare how dare he? <laughs> and you know this this topic of energetic vibrations and words. You know I'm really interested in this. Mm -hmm. It certainly relates back to training in one of my favorite words to teach people because it's a good way to protect yourself and that's nocebo. Oh yes. So many people are familiar with the placebo effect. Here, take this uh, pill, it'll cure you. Uh, turned out it was a sugar pill, but it cured you anyway, right? It yeah. didn't have the medicine, but it cured you. But if you write poison on a thing of water, that person is gonna feel sick when they drink it. If you tell a person that letting their knees go past their toes will hurt their knees, they're going to avoid that movement, they're gonna change their natural mechanics, and now the concept of knee pain is gonna be in there. And as you and I both know, pain often comes along with no mechanical damage whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Tons of people feel pain where there's there's nothing torn, there's nothing broken, there's, no, there's nothing wrong, but there's this, this pattern, and it's often a, a top-down type of thing, like, oh, if you do deadlifts, you hurt your back. Well, what if I drop something on the floor? Just never pick it up again, or invest in one of those, those grabbers. grabbers on the end of a stick? Yeah. And so the, the fear-mongering is a way that people elevate themselves and there are look there are real things that you would be well off to avoid like don't try to cross the freeway on foot that's not fear mongering that's just you know understand you're not going to be able to judge the speed of those cars moving mm. <laughs> as you walk across it will be something that you've never experienced before a lot of people try to cross the highway and get killed because they've never they have no concept of how difficult that would actually be. So there's a difference between telling the absolute truth and creating a fear and a nocebo, so a noxious or negative mm -hmm. stimulus, with a, especially with a movement. You know, our bodies evolved, depending on what you believe, evolved for a really long time mm -hmm. to work as good as possible. Oh, yes. But now suddenly there's like, I hate those videos. I hate them so bad. It's like the one with the check mark. Oh, and, and the, the big X. red X. Yeah. And, and there's that book, Eat This, Not That, Do This, Not That. It's, mm -hmm. it's just the logical end of 
the culture's desire to have some like finality to this is good and this is bad. So it's very binary thinking. Mm -hmm. But in terms of movement, there's no there's no bad movement. There's just an unprepared body. Yeah, unprepared or yeah, it's often happens with a new stimulus, right? New stimulus can lead to issues if the stimulus is too great or the load is too great, um, so to speak. So there's kind of a... a yeah, they're not prepared for yeah, that force. They're not prepared. So there's like a use it or lose it aspect to that. So if we take Absolutely. the knees over toes as the example, if you then start walking around avoiding that at all costs, then you don't use the ability to do that. And then all of a sudden you catch yourself in a lunge from falling where your knee travels past and now your knee hurts. Because your body, both the strength of the tissue and the neuromuscular connection to that pattern was unprepared for that amount of force. Mm -hmm. Because you stopped using it. Right. Yeah. I love those little maxims and aphorisms. If you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. A stitch in time saves nine. You heard that one? No, a stitch in time saves nine. So it's with sewing? Yeah. So a stitch in time saves nine, meaning if you um, get the stitch correctly in time, it'll save you the trouble of having to go redo nine of them. Mm -hmm. So it's basically saying that if you're... Do it right the first time. Yeah, if you yeah. do it right the first time, you save yourself a lot of trouble. And then one in the hand is worth two in the bush. I actually have a whole book of aphorisms. And it's it's fascinating because a lot of these statements have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a really long time for ideas to stick around. That's why I enjoy reading very old books that are still popular. Yeah. So the, the nocebo effect is probably the one of the worst types of adaptation because that's an adaptation. Yeah. Don't eat gluten or you will die of inflammation. Yeah. Don't eat a carb or you will get diabetes. Mm. Just eat meat or you will be in, inflamed all the way through. Yeah. So with with the stimulus of food, there's no SIBO. With the stimulus of exercise, there's no SIBO. With the stimulus of, I don't know, would there be a no SIBO effect with media? Probably not, because no SIBO is kind of like a, a top-down sort of thing. It's like you believe a, an idea or a story, and then that causes a change to what would naturally be the stimulus in a negative way. Mm. Yeah. But then again, you, I know some people that avoid negative stimulus from media or something like that at all costs. And then if it happens that they get exposed to that stimulus, all of a sudden they're feeling really down and like it go, mm. goes in a really bad direction. And that could very well just be that self-imposed nocebo effect where they're like, if I get that, this poor stimulus from a television, mm. um, then I'll react this way. Um, it's kind of like that idea, you know, your parents ingrain into you or you learn like what's good and bad. So if something happens and the story you believe is that's very bad, Mm. then you're going to feel like some catastrophe has happened when it might only be words. Mm -hmm. It might not be something that requires you to go into a full-blown meltdown. Yeah. But that nocebo, that believed story, creating that noxio noxious effect from an otherwise maybe neutral stimulus. Mm -hmm. Holy Lord. That, it's, so, it's so crazy. I mean... We're talking about something that has taken us so many thousands of years to understand. We fully can understand the practical application of it, 
and yet hardly anybody talks about it. And I think adaptability, kind of going back to our talk about fitness, which is well worth a listen if you haven't heard it, mm -hmm. that's the primary characteristic for exercise. Mm -hmm. You just want to be adaptable. You may not, you may find it a lot of fun to lift heavy weights. You may find it a lot of fun to do handstands and gymnastics, but ultimately the practical uh, attribute that you want to train is adaptability. And I usually take that a step further into elasticity. So being able to bend, but not break mm -hmm. with whatever force comes your way at whatever angle. And of course, if you're doing like jujitsu or tennis, which are all multi-vector sports, that's critically important to bend and not break, mm -hmm. and be able to coil and uncoil through these wide varieties of range of motion and speed and yeah. uh, total force. Kind of goes back to that said principle of always and exactly adapting and you're even more concise. If you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. So true. Man, what did we not talk about with adaptability? Hmm. Thought of something. Yeah. So I think a lot of people can relate to the the psychic energy drain of listening to someone complain about all their problems to them. And there are two ways that you can approach this. You can adapt to tolerate that. Not my first choice, personally. <laughs> Or you can create an adaptation in that other person mm. and draw your boundaries. And what I've found is it's uncomfortable for people to say no because we're so social and we're so looking for love all the time. But if you draw a hard line and you simply do not um, give any energy back, to those sort of things, you can alter that behavior in the future. So the adaptation is actually happening on their end. But basically what I'm saying is an energy vampire is looking to take some of your energy without adding any value to the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a form of parasitism, but it's, it's just with psychic energy instead of, you know, sucking blood or something. Yeah. And if you're good at drawing boundaries, if you don't give them what they're looking for, they will stop bringing that to your uh, attention. Mm. So it's possible to create an adaptation in relationships too. And I mean, shoot, I, I didn't even realize before I started thinking more deeply about these things, how many conversations I would be in where it was just a person telling me how bad everything was. And I understand the value of like venting. Mm -hmm. And I think that requires some kind of honest communication. If, you know, if you just want to vent about things, I can be here for you. Or <laughs> if you just want to vent about things, I'm not the person to be here for you, for yeah. example, which is totally legitimate. But my, my main point is adaptability happens within yourself. It also happens within other people. And so you can create adaptations that you want in others in mm. terms of how it affects you by drawing those boundaries or, on the other hand, uh, reaching out more frequently too. So it, it works both ways. Mm-hmm. So I think that's pretty darn important part of adaptation. Most definitely. There's that phrase, uh, what is rewarded is repeated. What is punished is avoided. That's also why it's difficult for some people to face their fears because they may have gotten hurt either emotionally or physically doing it another time in the past. Mm even if it's now the best opportunity for them to grow. 
Anything else you'd like to cover on adaptability? This was so much fun. Mm -hmm. This was great. Yeah. Maybe get this one transcribed. Yeah, we'll try that. Leave it out. Leave out that meteor metaphor that I out <laughs> that didn't fly at all. Can't win them all. <laughs> Can't win them all. Uh, win but them you got to keep trying. You got to yeah. keep trying. You can't let yourself get dejected from being temporarily rejected because it's not, <laughs> it's not personal. Why would you take anything personally? We're just the sum of all these different stimuli that we've had, mm -hmm. but we still all have that power to take a nice deep breath or to go for a walk or to lift some weights or to say something nice to someone or do some journaling. Mm -hmm. But it all comes back to uh, capturing your attention, regaining your focus, and remembering, like you said, we have this insane power to change any time yep so so use it wisely absolutely anders uh where can people find you if um want to get in touch well if they want to get in touch instagram is probably the easiest uh anders rubini so just my name perfect uh, and i should pop up uh if not you can check out uh ambitionathletics.com i'm the head trainer there so if you want to come do some uh, training, either in classes or a private setting, I'm available through there. Perfect. Yeah. Ander, Anders is the best. He's a very humble guy, but he's one of the most competent and compassionate coaches I've ever met in all of my traveling around the world, and I really mean that. I appreciate that. And, uh, of course, you can find me at maxshank.com and very, very rarely on Instagram <laughs> when it is time for me to release a new course. And uh, if you're interested in more about the ad adaptability that we've been talking about, Primal Athleticism is a really good uh, course to go through. And also the newest one, Elasticity, is very good for what we're talking about if you'd like to be able to adapt to any stimulus or environment. So mm -hmm. thank you guys so much for listening. Go ahead and share this with your friends. And... Leave us a comment. Let us know what you'd like to talk about next time. And I think we'll do this again. We have a lot more to... Oh, so much to cover. A lot more to discuss, more myths to bust. Uh, thank you again, everybody. Yeah. Appreciate it. And I will catch you next time. Thank you.